Sister Sims, her daughter, Sister Bjork, my sister, Sister Vonda, Sister James. I'm not going to go any further because so many have worked so faithfully and have done such a superb job of making this an enjoyable camp meeting to us all. And we thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for these sermons that have been preached to us night after night. Thank you, Elder Dyson, for Monday night's message. Amen. And tonight, I'm just going to ask you to continue. Let's wait upon the Lord and hear what the Spirit has to say as Brother uh, Wilson comes again to bring us the message we need to hear from the Lord. I'm so glad we're hearing. I feel like our ears have been opened, and I feel like, like scales are falling from our eyes, and we're beginning to get a vision of what God is expecting of this church. And I believe we're going to carry out the mandate of God. Amen. God bless you, Brother Wilson. If you'd open your Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter 11, I'm going to read a scripture, and I'm going to preach something altogether different from what I preached last night. Matthew, chapter 11, and verse number 20 and 21. Then began he to upbraid the cities in which most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And thou, Capernaum, verse 23, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Let's worship the Lord just a minute, one more time, and I want us to ask the Lord to talk to us one more time. We have heard so much tremendous, in fact, we have, uh, without belaboring the point, we have ate, we have eaten so well physically, um, it's just something. You ladies and men and who else has worked in this, done such a great job, and uh, it's a delight to be here and partake of that. The Word of God is so rich. I may talk about that a little bit more here in a few minutes. How many of you have enjoyed the Word of the Lord even tonight in a great way? Amen. I do believe, I do believe, this is not, this is not melodrama. This is not fell material while I try to prepare you for the Word of God. This is strictly and completely from my heart. I do believe that this is a momentous occasion in the life of this church right now this local church and I do believe that it is a beginning it is a beginning it does not take away from anything that's already been done obviously surely we're behind thinking um, of those kinds of things it is a beginning of something great that God wants to do and I'm going to talk about it tonight if God will help me let's pray God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your presence and spirit here tonight. Thank you for your love and your goodness and your kindness. Dear Lord Jesus, that has been richly poured out upon us. Touch us in these remaining few minutes. I pray for your glory and for your honor in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. I appreciated the way that Brother Haman obeyed the Holy Ghost in leading this service tonight. I believe this service has been led of the Holy Ghost to this point. I have no intention of preaching a lengthy, tiring message to you. I am going to simply tag in with the portion that I feel like the Lord has given me for the remaining concluding part of this service. I don't think we've waited to this point for God to talk to us. I think it is a good example that God can talk all through a service. And I mean talk distinctly and in a very real fashion. Amen. You feel that way tonight? Yeah. Praise God. But I do want the Lord to touch us in these remaining few minutes in a special way. I mentioned to you that I feel like we are living in a special day and in a special time. I really think that's true. I think the great gears of God's mechanism, His divine design, is 
moving in circumstances beyond this local church and all of us, but which cast us into the great mainstream of something that God, not man, not me, not Pastor Heyman, not these brethren, not the UPC, not the AMF, and not anybody else that God is trying to do to people who have the truth and who are hungry. Not to fuss, not to fight, not to be a political person, but to say, God, I want a move of God in my soul and in my life and in my ministry that supersedes all of this junk and gives me a fresh touch of heaven's breeze and lets me have the things God intended me to have. Amen. Let's thank him again for what we feel tonight. Amen. Now let me say that I don't think what God wants to do in the last time is going to be without controversy. I believe that there will be controversy. In fact, anybody that ever did anything for God in any fashion ends up controversial. That's why you need to find you an area of fellowship and people that you know that every time they hear a little something about you, and I know nothing that's being said about anybody here concerning their character or morals, but anytime somebody says anything about their style or the way they worship or the way they operate or what they do, not referring to doctrine or holiness or none of that, that we understand that we know one another and that we love one another. And we understand that when we begin to move forward in God, the devil's going to do his best to stop it. And we're going to have our fellowship anchored in faith, just like we've got our doctrine and progress anchored in faith. And nothing's going to shake that by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Now, everybody's not going to understand that. They're really not going to understand that. In a Reader's Digest several years ago, you may have read or heard the story. There was a fiction story in it by H.G. Wells. He is the same man who wrote The War of the Worlds, and they put it on the radio a few years back, scared everybody half to death. Uh, probably some of you heard the story. I don't know if you have or not. It's very short, and it's very applicable. It goes like this, that long years ago, Fleeing an evil Spanish ruler, a handful of Peruvian families in the country of Peru struggled through frightful gorges and over an icy pass to an isolated valley where they could have liberty and freedom. When they got there, they found a place that was lonely but had everything that they could have desired. It was a place that had sweet water rich soil and great pasture but a strange disease came upon these people and over a period of years it made all of the children that were born to them there blind and in fact several of the older children also were struck with this disease and became blind the process developed so slowly that they scarcely noticed their loss was over a period of years and those that were blind they guided these sightless youngsters until they knew the whole valley perfectly they understood where everything was and when at last sight had died out from among them the race lived on after a few years there was a stupendous volcanic explosion that took place in the valley and it cut it off from the concourse of all other men one of the original settlers, when this volcano exploded, happened to be on the other side of the great gorge and the chasm that was made as a result. And when it occurred, he told people on the outside about this people, this colony of blind folks that lived in the valley. And then shortly he died. And so there came to be the legend of the country of the blind. In fact, that's the name of the story that Mr. Wells wrote. And uh, even today, they tell us that the legend still lingers around the Andes. And then 14 generations later, after the disease had run its course 
and all of the people were blind but lived happily because they all knew the valley so well. It chanced that a man from the outside world came into this community. And the story I'm telling you tonight is the story of the man from the outside. His name was Nunez. He was a mountaineer. He was a very acute and enterprising man. He was a fellow that knew the country and he became a guide for uh, climbing parties. At a particular time, he took a climbing party of Englishmen to climb this peak uh, near there in Ecuador. And um, it was the Matterhorn of the Andes. After they'd worked their way on foot to the mount, uh, the bottom of the mount, they began to uh, uh, ascend to the top of the mountain. Somewhere along the way, they stopped and built a little shelter on the last precipice. During the night, Nunez disappeared. And when morning broke, the traces of his fall, where he had fallen from the mountain, were visible. He had slipped eastward, straight down the edge of this frightful precipice, and he had disappeared from them. They thought he was dead. But Nunez, who fell a thousand feet in the midst of a cloud of snow, survived. He was stunned, but he didn't have one single broken bone. He rolled down to gentler slopes, and he lay still, buried amid the white masses. Below him, he didn't see anything except another cliff, and then, in the distance, through the fog, he could see a valley. After a little climb, he came to the place where he could see a cluster of stone huts. High up and ringing the valley about was a wall of stones that had been built. When he finally came out to where the houses were, they shocked him in the way that they appeared. They were not set up just helter-skelter like most South American villages. But there was one main street. It was so clean that it amazed him. And the houses were set in perfect order on each side. Here and there, there was a little facade uh, on the front of the houses. And oftentimes, the front wall was pierced by a door, but never by a window. There was not even one window in the place. Not far from him, he saw three men carrying uh, some water. And he gave a mighty shout to them and hailed them. The men stopped and they turned their faces this way and that. But they did not appear to see Nunez. And so he cried again. And uh, when they did not appear to see him, even though they stopped, he said to himself, the fools must be blind. When at last he approached them, the three stood side by side with their ears directed toward him. He saw that their eyelids were closed and sunken as though the balls beneath had shrunk away. He heard one of them say, a man, either a man or a spirit, is coming down from the rocks. Nunez advanced with confident steps. As he got closer, he remembered an old proverb that ran through his thoughts. In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And he began to see visions of what could happen to him, having sight and them having none. And finally, one of the blind men asked another of the blind men, where does he come from, Pedro? And uh, one of them uh, waited, and then he himself spoke back and said, I come over the mountains, said Nunez. I come from Bogota, where there are a hundred thousand people. And what a beautiful city, so big that it passes out of sight. Sight, muttered Pedro. The three men startled him by a simultaneous movement toward him. He stepped back from them, from their advancing figures. The men felt him over. They touched him. They reached for him, and they felt of his face, his eyes, and his body. As uh, they did this, he waited until finally they looked at each other, and they said, this is a queer creature who has bumps beneath part of his face and whose eyelids flutter back and forth. But they said, let's lead him to the elders because he needs assistance. Nunez said to them, I can see. They looked back to him and said, see? He said, yes, see, I can see. And he turned quickly and stumbled against Pedro's pail. They looked at one another and they said, his senses must be imperfect. 
he stumbles. And the third said, we better lead him by the hand. Nunez laughed and said, have it as you will, lead me on. When he got to the village, he was thrust through a doorway into a room that was as black as pitch. Uh, being as they would believe and understand nothing, because for 14 generations they had been cut off from the world of sight. They uh, did not understand him at all. Finally, he decided that he would try to talk to them, and he said, I can see beautiful things. And they said, see? What do you mean by see? We don't have such a word as see. Finally, one day, one of them said to him, Hey, Bogota, that's what they called him. Come here. We want to take you down the path. But he decided he would show them once and for all that he knew how to walk. And so quietly, instead of going down the path, he stepped into the grass and took two or three steps on the grass. The blind man spoke to him and said, Don't walk on the grass, Bogota. That's not allowed. Nunez stopped. He was amazed that they could hear him. The owner of the forest came running up the path, rebuking him and saying, Must you be led like a child? And they took him and led him. But he laughed and said, I can see the path. And the man said, There's no such word as see. Come on, I'll lead you. Quit being foolish and follow me. Nunez followed a little further. He was annoyed. He said, My time will come. He said, In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And they looked at him and said, Blind? We didn't know there's any such word as blind. Four days passed, and finally on the fifth day, this king of the blind, still incognito as a clumsy and useless stranger among his subjects, he finally decided their senses were acute in their own world, but they could not see what he saw. Finally, he decided, I'm going to have to take dominance here. He thought of smiting one of them. He picked up a stick, and he said, I am going to smite them. And when he began to smite them, they could hear him, and they said, uh-uh. Put the stick down. It scared him. In fact, when they saw that he was going, when they felt that he was going to hit them, he turned and ran and they followed him. It's hard to tell a story when you can see about blind people. And they followed him and he became frightened until they got him cornered and he could feel them in a loose circle about him. And when he sensed that they were there, he said, get back. By this time, he was frantic. He was sobbing. He said, get away from me. Uh, leave me alone. I can see. They said, see? There's no such word as see. You must need help. Uh, and he said, I'll hit you if you come any closer. But they came closer, and they captured him. He slipped from their grasp and slipped through the wall. He lived outside of the wall for two or three days. It was cold. He didn't have anything to eat. He... He, it was a bad situation outside of the wall. And so eventually he turned and went back inside. And they said, when he came back in, they shouted to him. And they said, what are you doing? And with a sense of resignation, he said, I have been crazy. My senses are imperfect. I need your help. They looked at him and they said, that's better. Now tell us, can you see? He said, no. And weeping, he said, there is no such word as see. He was so weak and ill, he needed their help. He said, no, I made that word up. There's no such thing. So Nunez became a citizen of the country of the blind. The people became familiar with him. He became a servant of a man named Jacob, who became his master. And then there was a beautiful young lady named, no story's complete without a beautiful young lady. There was a beautiful young lady named Medina Sarote. And he could see her and others couldn't. And she still had places where apparently she had eyeballs, even though her eyes never opened. At times her lashes would flutter, but her eyes never opened. And it looked to him like this was a special person. They considered the girl disfigured because she had bumps under her eyelids. But he knew that she was beautiful. One day while he was resting, he talked to her about marriage. It caused a great dissension in the village. They discussed it at length and finally they said, we don't want this outsider to be a part of us. He's disfigured. His face is different. 
But he argued his case, and his master argued his case, and they said, finally, okay, he can marry her on one condition. He can marry her if he will get operated on and become as we are. If he will become normal, like the rest of us, If he will remove the difference between himself and the rest of us and get rid of his deformity, which is what blind people defined it as, then we will accept him. He was repulsed at the idea, but Medina Sarote talked to him daily and said, Bogota, won't you listen? Your eyes are distended. They stick out. Your brain must be in constant irritation having this difference between all of us normal folks and you. Won't you let them operate? It would just be a simple operation to remove your eyes. And then you could have me. And you could have the approval of everybody. He pondered it. For a while he said no. But eventually Medina Sarote persuaded him to face the blind surgeons. And the blind surgeons went to work to make blind the only man in the valley who could see. It was the night before the surgery. He thought, this is my last night that I will be able to see. And I'm going to go to a lonely place in the meadow where there are beautiful white flowers. And I'm going to remain until the hour of my sacrifice should come. When he got out there and saw the beautiful meadow in the dying light of sunset, looked back to the valley of the blind and saw the people going about in their perpetual darkness the duties of the day. Now don't get me wrong as I close the story. The blind folks didn't feel bad about being blind. They didn't know they were blind. He went on to say they had a beautiful relationship with one another. All the blind folks. They loved their children, and they took care of their children, and their children were happy in their blindness. But that night as he went out to look at the flowers one last time before his operation, he got a little further from the village than he had been a long time. And the village was built, of course, on the flat of the valley, on the bottom, where it would be easy for the blind folks to find their way. He went out to the wall. He went through a hole in the wall and he climbed up higher on the mountain. He stopped and looked back and saw it all and saw the beautiful flowers. And as he observed all of these things, the story uses the words, he began to climb. And as he climbed, when sunset finally came, he was far and high. His clothes were torn. His limbs were blood-stained. He was bruised in many places, but he stopped in one of those high places. And he lay down at ease as the glow of the sunset passed and the night came on. But still he lay on that high place, contented under the cold stars, smiling, satisfied to have escaped from the valley of the blind in which he had thought. To be king. And that is the end of the story. I think that you have made at least a partial application while I have talked. I think that what I'm saying tonight is a conclusion of many, many hours of meditation on my part, probably thousands. I think that what I'm going to say could be taken as being the sounds 
of someone who is deranged. I hope because he's different in a similar way to what this man was. But I do believe in my heart. For years, I have been involved in seminars to help people know how to do this and that and the other. And I came to a conclusion some months back that I'll never see what I want to see in God by seminaring alone. Because in this world, and God help me if I speak tonight and sound wrong because I just want to do the will of God. But in this world, which is by the word of God declared to be filled with blindness, Darkness has come upon the earth and gross darkness upon the people. That's what the Bible says. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. That's what Christ said. Not defining who's blind and who's not right now. I'm just telling you that for me to tell you that the world's blind is scriptural. I do believe that God is talking to the hearts of men to get beyond the chatter and the cacophony of confusion of worrying about things that don't even matter and saying, God, let me get a hold of something from heaven and let me go home to my city. And let me double in Baton Rouge in the next year. And Fresno and Modesto and Denver and Sacramento and wherever you may be from. And wherever the saints here tonight are from. That you can see God using someone to lift them to a place to lead us into things that we are not at yet. But that God wants to open our eyes to. And I have no ulterior motive in what I'm preaching tonight. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. I'm not worried about things that are peripheral. I'm saying, God, somehow, to get along with the world, don't let me, now that I'm 38 years old, and I've tried a lot of things that worked, and a lot of things that didn't, in attempt to stay where I could see from the heights uh, and have what I need to lead your people in this time. Uh, don't let me sacrifice my sight uh, to have the approbation uh, of people that are blind. I believe that God wants to use me in my city to have the biggest church in that town. How many you run, brother Wilson? A couple hundred. How many's biggest church run? I don't know, three or four thousand probably. You think you'll be bigger in number? I don't know. I think I'll be as big. Is everybody in your town going to get saved? No, but this church ought to be the dominant church in Denver, where that anybody that does want to get saved knows where to go. It's not the dominant church right now. Don't take me wrong. I'm not throwing at you. All I'm saying is, when I say that, don't try to operate on me. And don't operate on yourself. And say, I'm going to live among the blind. I do not believe that God saved me just to pastor 200 people. I'm not bragging. God knows my heart tonight. If you think I'm off in this stuff, you just pray. God knows my heart. God knows how I'm preaching to you. I am saying that I believe God can put something on us, and I believe we ought to be intense about it. I'm telling you, every time something comes across the pulpit, and we all make light of it and say, Boy, he really blistered this tonight. I'm telling you, that's wrong. We need to understand that if God's going to talk to us, we've got to understand the sobriety of it and say, That's God talking to me, and I'm going to act on that. Oh, I believe we've heard from God tonight. Amen. I believe that. God wants to do something. He wants to do something to us, in us, and through us.
What if? I don't mean to leave Brother Spell out of this. He'll understand. What if in the western part of the United States of America, and I'm not saying this egotistically either, but that is where the action is going to be if God tarries for the next 50 years probably, is in the western part of the United States. Economically, cities are decaying in the east, but they're burgeoning in the west. When you look at it politically, the dominant figures are arising from the west, not from the east. When you look at it geographically, Europe used to be what dominated our commerce. But we that are in the west have the advantage because commerce has moved to Japan and California. And it's on the Pacific Rim that things are happening. And we all live towards the Pacific Rim rather than the Atlantic area. I'm not big, I'm not, I'm, all I'm doing is telling you the facts tonight. Uh, could it be that God saw these things were going to happen? And is putting men in strategic cities uh, that are big and burgeoning. They are population centers. Uh, and God has seen that even though none of us uh, have risen up to be uh, what we can be, uh, God has seen that when the time comes, and perhaps now is, there is going to be men that are refusing to be blinded and are going to say, God, in our dominant city position, we're going to reach and dominate the most powerful area of the entire world. Oh, let's love the Lord and ask Him to help us right now. And every time you preach something like this, somebody says, well, I wonder if he's going to talk about getting out of the UPC or getting out of the AMF or getting in the AMF or getting in the UPC. Now, I'm going to tell you something. First of all, everybody gets cold feet when you start talking like this. Everybody goes hyper diaper like you're going to commit some kind of travesty of good judgment. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't think it's going to matter a plug nickel what your card carrying membership may or may not be. I don't know how many people I've had tell me and tell others. I think Wilson's getting ready to kick all the walls down and then leave the UPC. That's, that makes some of you happy, I'm sure. I, I don't intend to leave. It's just no big deal. You're not. I don't care if you are or you aren't. Do you preach the truth? Do you love God? Do you want to see revival? Are you a man of God? Yes, you are. Don't look at me like some cross-eyed buzzard that's off in left field. I'm telling you, I'm not defending stuff that's going to pass away anyway. I'm going to try to get a hold of something that is going to dominate the world with revival and change us. And somebody that doesn't have an axe to grind or a bone to pick and has nothing but the love of God in their heart and a burden for souls is going to have to somewhere finally crack this kind of thinking and say, I don't have any animosity. I'm just saying, brethren, let's get on something bigger than worrying about a bunch of foolishness. I'm not talking about those people that's immoral or nothing. You already know that. I don't have to go through all that baloney just to prove I'm on target tonight. Somebody says, well, Brother Wilson, if you believe this is a dominant church in this city, what about the other Jesus' name churches? Well, they didn't ask me to preach. You did. I believe God wants them to be dominant too. But it's us here tonight that's saying, God, I don't want nobody operating on me. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I'm trying to be a man of God. Don't try to cut my eyes out. Don't try to tell me. Don't, don't, don't try to tell me that God's not trying to do something. 
Don't try to tell me that you're going to get it done without men that know what they're doing and have a vision and have a burden and aren't afraid to step out with a little Holy Ghost creativity and say, God, give us some latitude to understand the mind of the Spirit and have a Holy Ghost revival that will bring the love of God to the hearts of millions. I don't care what you believe about world end time revival. Worldwide, I don't care. I mean, I care, but I don't right now. I don't care. Just leave me alone. Don't try to take the Bible and tell me what I can or can't have in relationship to the blessings of God. I know what I can and can't have. And I can have what I'm preaching about tonight. Brother Morton took church president. was running about 175, 10, 11 years ago. I suppose they averaged six or seven hundred on Sunday morning and maybe that many on Sunday night. He's not compromising. He's not doing it to prove that he can do something to somebody. Brother Keys went to Modesto three or four years ago. He's run about a hundred and fifty, hundred and Forty, I don't know. And I, I preach for him now. And I don't lie. I don't knowingly lie. I may tell something that's not true ignorantly, but that's not lying. That's something else. I preached for him on Sunday night, and there was over 500 people in that place. About 500 people, at least 500 people. Worshiping, praising God. Couldn't get them all in the building. People in children's church and ushers everywhere. And it was a, I'd hate to, I'd hate to pastor his church the way it is right now. Chairs everywhere. People stumbling all over each other. My God, you can't hardly breathe in the place. It's just bodies. And I want to, somebody says, well, Brother Wilson, do you believe you can set a goal to have that kind of thing? The other day I said, bless God, we're going to have a revival. Somebody looked at me and they said, you are? Oh, and I knew what they were implying. They were implying I couldn't have that unless God just decided. It's, I'm just going to go ahead and give you a revival. I don't believe that either. Uh-uh. I believe I can have it. I believe Denver can have it when they say we're going to have it. We're going to have it. Amen. You're not saying it smart, Alec. You're not trying to command God. You are appropriating what God has already promised uh, if we will believe uh, and reach out for these things. Brother Wilson, what's your motive tonight? My motive is that Phoenix, Arizona, Tempe, which is a part of Phoenix, has a revival that shakes Arizona. That Fresno, which is right in the middle of California, has a revival that shakes California. That Modesto, that's a little further north, uh, has a revival that shakes Northern California. That Sacramento, which is the capital of California, with over one million people, and has never had an apostolic church shake the city yet. Uh, that some way God can move into that place, uh, and that He can crack the walls, uh, and crack the barriers. And while people are saying, I'm telling you, I have had people say everything in the world they could say. First thing they said, people, I mean, people that ought to know better. I said, Brother Wilson, when you go to Sacramento, you need to think twice. Because you can't expect to have the revival that you had in Flint, Michigan. That's where I used to pastor. Had a great revival. God bless. You can't expect to have that. You know what that is? That's Medina Sarote saying, if you love me, let me operate on you. Amen. And I've gone through all kinds of hassle since I've been there. And I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me. Mm -mm. People that can see don't ask people to, to feel sorry for them. They just say, I can see. I'm going to get up on a high place and I'm going to look and I'm going to see. And, and, and God's blessed. We had some people move in. Four, five, six families that moved in. That loved us and that have helped us to do the work of God there. We have, it, it went for weeks with no revival. We preached to ourselves. My wife and I wondered, dear God, what are we doing? We looked at each other. We laughed. We, we made fun of ourselves. It was, it was such a 
Such a terrible thing. Brother Morton said it's the worst situation he's ever seen because he had to work with it even before I got there. There was nine people there when I got there. The pastor was immoral and they'd finally thrown him out. Uh, and uh, he'd thrown himself out. Uh, it was a big, oh, terrible deal. The place was as filthy as his spirit was. Uh, the, the bills were not paid. Uh, the, the, the building was run down. Uh, the, the, the foreclosure papers came in the mail. Uh, and everything was going wrong. Uh, and, and, and on top of all of that, uh, uh, everybody down the nose at poor old little old brother Wilson uh, and feeling bad at him because he said in his own mind right or wrong I'm preaching what I think when you preach you can preach what you think uh, I'm preaching what I think uh, because I said God uh, I know uh, that I may offend somebody but I can't let people cut my eyes out that's all I got to see with uh, I got to see what I'm doing we're not big but we're growing praise God we've been in a Grange Hall it's a dastardly place it's a terrible place. Saturday night is our first service in a new rented building. And it's our own building. I mean, it's leased, but it's in a business park. It's where there's warehouses. I don't care if you laugh. I wouldn't be offended. It's warehouses. It's, it's uh, where you buy trailer parts and, and uh, big old carpet uh, wholesale houses and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> There's so many people talking to the dust and saying, My God, God's against Wilson, God's this and God's that. You know what you gotta feel if you're in that position? That position? That position? You gotta feel like everybody doesn't know the definition of to see. And people that cannot see cannot see. Profound, huh? And because they cannot see, they do not appreciate. And when they don't appreciate, they fear. Let me tell you, folks, don't get a better than now attitude. Don't get a I'm the only one in the world that knows what I'm doing attitude. But I want to tell you, you do have to have a sense that God has put a finger of destiny upon our church. And God has put a finger of destiny upon our pastor. And God has some things in store for him that the world's never seen yet. And when you pray for your pastor, you need to pray for his vision. God, don't let the devil operate on him. Don't let depression operate on him. Don't let discouragement dim his vision. Don't let anybody discourage him. Don't don't let him get wrapped up in stuff that don't matter. Help his vision to be, to carry out the great commission. To seek and save that which is lost and bring him to the light where they can see. Once they were blind, but now they see because you did not let somebody make you blind. Let's love the Lord. I know I did not get back to my text, but I don't have time. We'll pick it up in the rapture, and I'll tell you what I was going to say on that. We need to set our flight tonight towards the skies. And we need to say, God, I have a vision of a mighty revival. In closing, I want to tell you. Because I want you to watch and help me pray and see if some way I could be a true prophet. I want to be a true prophet. And one of the ways you know if a man is a true prophet is whether or not his prophecy comes true. I want to be a true prophet. When I went to Sacramento, before I got there, I was in my father-in-law's house praying. My father-in-law lives in Stockton. It was Brother Haney's church. And while praying there, I said, God, you know where I'm going. I feel the will of God in it, but I want a confirmation. I don't want to be a big I and little use, but I want God's blessing on my life. If I don't have your blessing, I want God's blessing. If I do have your blessing, I want God's blessing. And I said, God, would you touch me? I feel like God talked to me.
and said. Now, I've never told anybody this. Preaching, I have in private. I don't think I've ever told this. God spoke to my heart and said, Nate, what do you want? And I said, God, I want a church that's bigger and better, more glorious, more holy, more precious, more effective than the church that I used to pastor. I want it to be freer. I want it to have more liberty. I want it to be more flexible. I want it to be closer to you. I want it to be growing faster. And God stopped me. He said, I'll give that to you. So that's why I want you to go to that city in the first place. I got people there. And I said, God, I want to do your will. The Lord spoke to me and said, you talk about growth, what kind of growth do you want? I said, God, I want growth three times faster and bigger and better and more to the glory of God than I had ever in my life. I want growth four times faster. I, I want it five times as large and glorious for your namesake. There's nothing wrong with that. The Bible says when you pray, you should pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want his kingdom established on earth. And it seemed like God was on my side while I was praying and, and spoke to the other me. My conscious mind was praying and my subconscious mind was monitoring what my conscious mind was doing. And God seemed to speak to my subconscious mind and say, Why didn't you smite it repeatedly? Because every time you smote it, it was a victory. And my mind expanded. I said, God, God, God. God, I can't think big enough. I can't. God, don't let this moment pass. I feel like I'm on holy ground. My shoes are off. The bush is burning. God, don't let it pass. In my little life, God, give me more than that. Five times, six times, eight times. Oh, God, let the mind of Christ determine the depth and height of liberty and victory that we could be led to in that city, God. I don't want anything less than everything you've got. And God seemed to speak to me and say, You'll have many opportunities to leave here. And they will be tempting. But if you will stay, I will give you everything you've asked for. It didn't look like that for a year. It seemed like we went through hell on earth. It was a terrible night to walk in and the blind folks didn't help much but I said God if as a poor poor specimen of a Christian preacher if I can keep my eyes on you you're looking at one old boy that may go down but he'll go down swinging I'm not going to acquiesce to the world nor the flesh I will not lose my faith. I will not lose my vision. I will hold on when everything says it can never happen. We'll run about 200 now. God's blessing. Uh, there was men then that gave to the church. They pledged $100 a month of baptizing offerings and they didn't have it. Dear God, some of them didn't have groceries to eat. And now some of those same men are making $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 a week. Three years. What are you talking about? I'm talking about it's time, church. The Holy Ghost spoke through these ministers tonight. It's time for us to say, God, all things are ready. We've got a preacher to preach to people. And we're here. And we're going to lift our vision. And we're going to soar to the heights. And we're going to believe you for a revival that will shake this place. An apostolic, Holy Ghost-filled revival. All across the West, my heart burns. Only God knows how it burns. With a burden to see a revival. And it depends on individual men in strategic cities and individual churches in those cities. All right? You ready for this? 
I believe we're going to see it. Not in every city, not in every place, but where there are men that have firmly decided where they stand concerning the word of God and doctrine, concerning separation from the world, concerning unalterable faith that will not be variable in the face of circumstances, who will not allow themselves to get sidetracked to fight battles that are of time and not of eternity, but who say, Jesus, let me love every soul with the power of God and bring people to a revelation of truth. You say, Brother Wilson, how can my pastor pastor 3,000 people? He can do it. When you turn your headlights on, they don't reach all the way from Denver to Los Angeles. That's how faith and wisdom is. God will give you enough faith and wisdom to see far enough ahead to be safe. And when you get to there, God will make sure the headlights shine on to the next place. Just don't let anybody smash your faith with fear or doubt. If you have preachers that come by here, Brother Haman doesn't know what we're all going to preach when we all get here. If they come by here and they start making fun of, poo-pooing the idea that you can have what we're talking about. Love them, love them, but pray for them. If somebody goes home and says, well, I just don't know if that can happen. Oh, friend, you may not know, but if you'll believe, you'll see it happen. The reason other folks haven't seen it is they sat around and said, I don't know. And last of all, a small church is better than a big one in some ways. But the one thing that makes that not satisfactory is that a small church is too expensive. Because you can only keep it small at the expense of two million other people that's going to be burning in hell. And that costs too much. That's a luxury we can ill afford. It doesn't matter if they're red or yellow, black and white. Well, Brother Wilson, if we get a mixed color in our church, it won't work. It'll work. How will it work, Brother Wilson? I don't know. God will give the pastor wisdom. The headlights will show it. Brother Morton's probably got 175 Spanish-speaking or Sp Mexican people in his church and, and, and Anglos. And Brother Keys has got at least that many. And there's a great revival that somebody says, bless God, I don't want anybody except certain kinds. You can just hang it up, buddy. He said, go, the man read it tonight, go to the highway and hedges and compel them. I don't care who they are. The lame, the halt, the blame. God hates these empty benches. He hates them. I know all the other side. You can say, yeah, but God don't want them filled up with people that don't love the truth. I know that. But there's people that will love the truth if we'll go out there and get them. Let's stand and love the Lord. If you feel this service was ordered of God, you're ready to accept the challenge, and you know that God has spoken to you. If you are ready to forget your petty pride, your name, forget everything about your person, and say, God, I'm offering myself to the cause of Jesus Christ in this city. If you're a part of this assembly and you're a man, I'm asking you to step into this altar. The leadership, Calvary Apostolic Church. Lord has spoken 
You're answering that challenge by coming to this altar tonight. Forget your pride. Forget your name. Forget your family. Forget about your talents or your lack of talents. Let's surrender to Jesus right now. Church, would you pray? Hallelujah. 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 Every wife, every son, every daughter that's ready to meet this challenge, would you come and join the heads of the homes of this congregation right now? Just come quickly and let's surrender to the Lord as one in Jesus' name. Let's commit ourselves to fulfilling the will of God for our hour. Everyone, let's pray. Let's surrender to God. Let's commit ourselves to the Lord. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all to be a really dear. I will ever love, trust Him. Jesus, I surrender, take me, Savior, holy thy, let me feel your Holy Spirit, make me, Savior, keys would you come pray our concluding prayer for this week's services in particular to this service tonight let's yield ourselves to God. dear God tonight our hearts are filled with thanksgiving we are thankful, O oh God, that you have spoken to us. Thankful, God, that you have allowed us to enjoy your spirit in such a marvelous way. Thank you, God, for the great fellowship that we have experienced. Most of all tonight, God, there's a deep, overwhelming, that you have allowed us to be a part of what you're doing in this earth. We know, God, that there are more effective means whereby you could establish your kingdom. 
somehow in your mercy and your unfathomable love, you have chosen to use us to bring your kingdom to pass. I pray, O oh God, we would not be sidetracked by the affairs of this life. I pray, O oh God, that we could follow the direction and the flow of your Spirit. I trust, O oh Lord, that because we have been in this meeting, because you have spoken to us and because you have dealt with our hearts that we will leave here more effective to the furtherance of your cause for that purpose we have been born for that mission we have come to this world we pray O oh God that your anointing and your favor would be on every member of this congregation we trust, O oh God, that their eyes would be enlightened to all that you have for them. And that you'll give them courage and commitment and desire to fulfill that place in your body that you would have them to fill. I trust, O oh God, that there'll be a mighty, mighty, mighty blessing of your spirit that will be upon them as they go forth to carry out your commission. I pray especially tonight, God, for the great pastor of this church, for his family. You understand and you know your great, wonderful will for this church. And I believe, O oh God, that you are going to equip him for the challenge. Trust, O oh God, that we will hear the reports. Tremendous, and great, and mighty victory come about for the honor of your name through this church. We ask you all of these things in the holy, righteous, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Everyone said amen. Inasmuch as we have outgrown our camp meeting facility in the mountains, we have transferred our meeting to the church. Word count meeting has become a misnomer.